gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, we got a little bit of foreigner going on in the background, and they're going to be talking about waiting. Haven't you all been waiting? Many of you have mortgage issues, and we kept telling people, those of us who helped put together SACCOM, that we weren't ready to handle mortgages just yet. Let me go ahead and turn down Foreigner. You guys know this song. I've been waiting for a girl like you. Okay. Uh, anyway, as the world turns, we're going to add some more media. But let's go ahead and um, explain the mortgage thing so that everybody gets it. What's happening is that all of the things that were working all of the legitimate things that you had the right to do, they were interfering with, they were stopping it from working. They were coming up with technicalities, things that weren't even legal for them to do, and they were doing it. They were letting them violate the contract. Why were they letting them violate the contract? Because many of you had signed over your power of attorney. What? That's right. Many of you, when you signed the documents, you gave them power of attorney by giving them power of attorney you basically took all of your own power away just that simple okay you gave them all of your authority and you did it knowingly what do you mean they didn't tell me yes they did they put the papers right in front of you. You had every right to go over those documents before signing them. But you were so in a rush. Oh, if I don't sign them, I'm not going to get the home. And so you signed the documents. Okay, that was your fault. Nobody else can be blamed for that but you. I'm sorry, but that's the facts. That's the truth. Somebody's going to come back later saying, I'm sorry, that's the facts, that's the truth, and want to be sarcastic. They'll be <clears throat> messing with the wrong person at that time. Now, hold on, y'all. There are certain songs by Marvin <laughs> that I don't play, and one of them is that, S wake up, wake up, wake up. Hold on, can't hear it. Uh-oh, no wonder. Oh, yeah, we can, we can play this song. Okay, y'all know we going to play this song. Now, y'all may not be able to hear it, but y'all know the words, so sing along with Marvin while I'm talking. So, ladies and gentlemen, as we say, I'm installing my Hewlett Packard Pro 8740 into this unit, and it's supposed to be getting out of my way. But I guess it don't. There we go. Whew. All right. What's happening with the uh, properties is that individuals were going through bankruptcy trying to save their property through bankruptcy that wasn't working so they were trying to figure out how am I gonna do this how can I save my house how can I get my house back we have had some success as of late so we're gonna let you know about it let's see I don't want none of that I didn't even ask for none of that right there alright what happened is we had uh, an individual who watched my videos and by watching my videos, I told everybody they could start their own debt collection company. All they have to do is take this information and apply it. So he listened to the video. He took the information. He applied it. And he has literally, over the past year, made a profit in over $40,000. A three-man company. Three-person company, we should say. Just that simple. But then he went ahead and didn't just stop with listening to my videos he went a little bit further in studying the law and studying the angles that people were going at and so he created an agreement an affidavit and he presented this now I can't tell you the agreement or the affidavit and how he did it because if I told you that pay attention if I told you that then you would be able to compete with him and we're not gonna have that you see I don't mind you competing with me I don't mind you trying to duplicate the things that I do. That's why I talk about it. Now, I do mind you, if we're working with you at SACOM, you're trying to duplicate the things SACOM is doing for you. I mind you if you're doing that because SACOM's trying to help you. 
we're SATCOM is not there for you to be competing with because you can't we're not going to share everything I'm not going to share everything with you all about SATCOM are you crazy see because it's not designed that way that's not what these videos are for I'm not sharing that information because I'm not trying to kill that organization so this is the program that SATCOM is putting together hold on let me see if I have that window still open so we can show it to you it's going to be this one right here the sitcom arbitration association I was having several conversations with people today because I was watching a video let me see if I can pull up that video we have to go here and I was watching this video earlier guilty this was about elder barge and the barge family and I say elder barge but it wasn't about him but at least of the five minutes at least two and a half minutes were about elder barge okay because he's the one that they made more popular than everybody else but it was about Bobby and it was about Chico I actually have respect for that entire family especially knowing the things that they went through the person doing this video I don't have respect for them because what they did is they decided to highlight all the negatives as opposed to adding in the accomplishments of that family and what they were able to do and how they provided a lot for people during that era who lived in the inner city okay now what we are doing what am I doing here I gotta show you guys something uh-oh We're going to put in how to become an arbitrator. Ladies and gentlemen, because I assure you, this is not difficult to do. It's not the becoming an arbitrator. Anybody can be an arbitrator. No, they can't. Yes, they can. Anybody and their grandfather can be an arbitrator. Then what's the problem? Well, what happens is arbitration has to be agreed upon by the parties. So in order for you to become an arbitrator, you have to have both parties agreeing to your contract. Now we're going to take the time to explain this to you. My hope is that you'll take the time to understand this. We told you about the case where the young men who were in jail, they put together a contract. And in that contract that they put together, they it's this video right here. Right here. Becoming an arbitrator, qualifications for becoming an arbitrator, and the process of becoming an arbitrator. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that this gentleman did this video. And when he did this video, it's after 40 years of experience. He was an administrative law judge. He's been a college professor. He's also been a insurance deputy commissioner. So he goes over his entire span career and how long he's been an arbitrator and he does this for about two hours explaining. But what he did is he talked about private arbitrators and private associations. So that's why I was watching the videos because I wanted to make sure a private organization could form an arbitration association. And all arbitration associations are private organizations. So I said, wait a minute, arbitration is a private administrative alternative remedy pay attention private administrative alternative remedy why private alternative administrative remedy that's the actual phrase private alternative administrative remedy but it's a private administrative alternative remedy what do you mean well it's not administrative what do you mean it says administrative right in the title no it says an alternative administrative remedy an alternative to the administrative remedy okay that's what it's saying it's legalese people you already know what an administrative remedy is a remedy that's provided by government through statute but arbitration is provided not uh, 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 uh. you're not paying attention arbitration is provided by and through statute pay attention you're not paying attention this is an alternative to the administrative remedy. That's why it's called an alternative administrative remedy. Alternative to the administrative remedies that are already out there. It's an alternative. Hey, I'm going down this road. Uh-oh, there's a roadblock. Okay. 
<sighs> we gotta go down uh, 15th Street, then we gotta take a left on Crocker, and then we gotta take another right on Bronson. And then after we go to Bronson, we're gonna have to go about seven to eight blocks, and then we can turn on either 45th Street, or we can turn on either uh, 51st Street if we keep straight. So, what you wanna do? See, that's called taking an alternative route. You're no longer on that road. You're taking a different route to get to where you're going. It's an alternative to the administrative route. Arbitration has nothing to do with administrative. Even though it says an alternative administrative remedy, it means it's an alternative to the administrative process. Whee! That's right. That's the point, ladies and gentlemen. Arbitration is a pay attention common law remedy. Okay, you don't believe me. Let me point it out to you. Let's see, we're going to go here. And I just typed in arbitration in the 1100 BCE. Okay? Just 1100 BCE. I could have gone 3500 BCE, but it's okay. Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There was this guy, and these people didn't like him. And they had their laws, but the problem is they lived in a country where their laws didn't work. Okay? Pay attention. It says, subject, classical studies, withdrawal of the Athenian ships from the Pleo, you know, I knew how to, Plo, dang it, I can't say his name. It's uh, one of the Grecian, um, one of the Grecian commanders. That's the group. He had his own portion of the military. And it says, will only offer independent arbitration. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, arbitration dispute and final offer of arbitration uh, let's make sure. Nope, that's not what I'm. I'm not looking for that. I said 1100 BC is a decade, which the latest blah 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 millennium millennium. That doesn't. I'm looking for arbitration. This one actually has arbitration. Okay, please understand. Arbitration is a grandfathered process. It is a common law process. It was there before statute. Let's get back to my story. Y'all don't mind if I tell y'all a story. Okay, well, this guy, nobody liked him. Only a few people liked him, and the people who liked him didn't have any power. And so this other group of people who had these little stupid laws, they came up with their little statutory laws, and then they took him to jail, and they bound him under their statutory laws, but then they had to go to the real courts, because they weren't real courts. Okay? They had to go to the real courts, and ladies and gentlemen, when they went to the real courts, they had to ask permission for them to be able to continue. And so they asked permission of the real court. Oh, lordy, lordy, lordy. The real court said, hey, hold on. I want to speak to him first. So the real court spoke to him and said, what y'all doing? Y'all ain't got no right to be sitting up here bringing him in here because of no, no, what y'all, no, y'all can't do that. Y'all can't do that. Okay, so if you don't understand what I'm talking about, that was the situation with the only true Christ known as Jesus. He was brought before an arbitrator. The Jews had already had their so-called meeting. They had already established their contract. What further need do we have for witnesses? You heard him! Admit it! Okay, so they had their contract. Now they took their dispute to Pilate. Pontius Pilate stood there and he heard both sides of the story. He heard the testimony of both parties. And when he questioned the other party, he found that there was no cause for their complaint, that their complaint was deficient. But these individuals insisted. You know what? The person who Pilate had that was supposed to arbitrate their side only spoke about truth. Only spoke about, this is the reason I came here to bear witness to the truth. I didn't come here to sit up here and beg you to let me go. Go back and look. 
So he did not offer a rebuttal to what they were saying. He asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Then he said, are you not going to answer me? Do you not know that I have the power and authority to release you and the power to impel you? He said, you would have no authority at all. Y'all hear me? He said, you would have no authority at all if it had not been granted to you. Oops. Wait a minute. Hold on. He would have no authority if it would not be granted? That was his only defense? That's right. He did not counter what the other party said. So he says, all right, what do you want me to do with him? And they said, impale him. Put him to death. He says, why? What did he do? And they screamed all the more. Why? Because he didn't offer a defense. He was held in default. It was an arbitration. If you don't believe me, Pilate was supposed to be the independent arbitrator. They have been doing arbitration for centuries, ladies and gentlemen. We told you about how two kingdoms would be angry at each other because of some conflict between each other. And they would have another kingdom in the middle of them. And neither could cross that kingdom without getting permission from that king. And he had already made it quite clear that he would not sit up there and allow them to come into his territory under any circumstances. So they would have to go to that king in the middle and they'd say, all right, you sit up there and you broker this. We're going to do a peace summit. And he would sit there and hear both sides and whatever he decided, they had to agree with it. The United States did it with Amor Sadat and Yasser Arafat. It was called the Camp David Peace Accord, or arbitration. You heard me? The United States sat as the arbitrator. Israel, or excuse me, um, Egypt. And no, 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 that was Israel and uh, Palestine, sorry. Israel and Palestine sat there with the United States acting as arbitrator. Every matter that goes before the UN is an arbitration matter with, between countries. The deal with Saddam Hussein, did they not give him an opportunity to come and plead his case? Did the United States not sit up there and put together their evidence? Did the arbitrating committee not issue sanctions? That's right, the United States not only sat as arbitrator, but they also sat as complainant because they have that in their contract. Imagine that! So ladies and gentlemen, what we have done understanding that every arbitration is an association well there is no such thing as an administrative association all associations are private they're private organizations private corporations so go ahead and look up arbitrator and see if they don't all belong to an association and those who do not belong to an association or a company or a corporation all corporations are private there's no such thing as a public corporation it's not possible doesn't operate that way. The private attorney general, I mean the private attorney generals anyway, the private arbitrators, you will see they operate their own system. They have their own set of clients. Okay? That's how the system works. But they have made it look like only they, attorneys and judges, are the ones who can do arbitration. That no other company can. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell it to you like it is. I wish I had known this before. I wish I had known about arbitration, about it being a private remedy for people. Let's see if I still have it up. Let's go here. And nope, this ain't it because that ain't the arbitration. Then it's got to be, is it going to be, no, it's not going to be there. It's going to be here. Arbitration defined. Please understand. Most arbitration is driven by pre-dispute contracts entered into by the parties in which they agreed that the dispute, if it should arise, will never get into the court. Arbitration is the court's way of keeping arbitrations out of the court, and it's your way of keeping your matter out of the court. By agreeing to arbitration, the parties, perhaps, among other things, are waiving their fundamental constitutional rights to a trial by jury of their peers. Well, good. Because you know a jury sits up there and listens to that wonderful, ignorant group of attorneys, the judge, and the two attorneys who are all officers of the court. It's all one-sided to begin with. They can have no de novo second trial after they have gone to arbitration. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. You don't get to have a second trial with arbitration. Arbitration, the arbitrator is only there to determine whether or not the individuals 
have violated the terms of the agreement. Well, do you know what the government has been doing all of these years? We told you about, and go look it up for yourself. It's under Statement of Purpose, New Hampshire House Bill 70, 1778. New Hampshire House Bill 1778. Look at Statement of Purpose and see how it says that the government and the government agents have been doing these things called offers to contract. And by doing these so-called stupid offers to contract, that's how they've been binding you to these contracts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing the same thing to them. We've created a contract. We've created a contract that binds them. Oh, the tie that binds. Yes, I saw that movie. Okay, let's see if I can pull it up. You see my screen is flickering and it ain't supposed to be doing that. So I'm using up a lot of resources. So let me pause it for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where I am these days so that I can explain this to all of you. We got Marvin going in the background, but I'm going to go ahead and stop all the music so that we can go ahead and explain this to you guys without any distractions to me or to you. This is from the government printing or government publication office. Government printing office. Okay? Now, this symbol, this law is no fluke. They want to say that the act for the justice relief for Bradley Christopher Stark, I refer to him as Chris Stark, Shawn Michael Rideout, and certain named beneficiaries never happened. They say that this is fraudulent. Okay, fine. This is my prima facie evidence that I'm relying upon. And by law, as long as I rely upon this in good faith, I don't want to hear it. That's what the law says. So I'm relying upon this in good faith. Now I want you to pay attention to this act that was enacted by Congress. It was later amended, and because of the amendment, they allowed it not to pass. If they had not amended that, this would be in full force. But we don't pay attention, care about whether or not this act is now enforceable or not. We're not concerned about that. All I was looking for was a certified copy of this act. Now pay attention. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. The first thing they do is they give you the defamonitions. Okay? Now why? Because the original act that was put together was put together by the attorney for these gentlemen. He and Mr. Let's get his name, y'all, so y'all can know about the, the Rand people. Well, I can't get there. Hold on. Hold on. Uh-oh. Oh, that's right, because the bill was introduced by Rand Paul. So we're not going to find his name on here. Okay? Now, first, the agreement means... The Stipulation and Settlement Agreement, May 22nd, 2015. Okay, then they did an addendum in December of 2015. Let's get this to go on up so that I can keep it moving. All right. The term Attorney General means the Office of the Attorney General of the United States. The term Award and Interim Award and Final Award mean with respects to the agreement the final binding and non-appealable decision and remedies of the arbitrator awarded pursuant to the agreement. Okay? Non-appealable. I am not reading to you something Congress enacted and didn't enact. I am letting you know that they are giving you the definition of these words. Now let's go. We don't care about all these beneficiaries because that's a lot of beneficiaries. They went ahead and amended this and added everybody. Grandmother, grandfather, grand cousin, grand uncle, grand niece, grand nephew. They done grand everybody in here. Don't worry about it. When we help one of them, we'll be helping all of them. And the corporate beneficiary means any one of the following beneficiaries individually or in combination thereof or both. You see all these banks they done named? Now, see, I, I didn't go into detail as to why all of them didn't do it. The FAA, that's why we're the SAA, Federal Arbitration Act, not the Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Arbitration Act. Okay.
Let's keep going. And see, when you read this and you see where they put in certain things, you would think it was written by some one of them sovereign cinema sins, but this was written by Congress. The congressional findings. This is all that matters. None of the other stuff matters. The, the amount of the award, none of that matters. Congress finds that the United States, pay attention, by and through the Attorney General, entered into an agreement with the parties. This involved an agreement. That was a binding agreement. How do we know? Number two, the agreement is a valid and binding settlement agreement between the parties in the United States that operates in the nature of a release dismissal agreement. It's a binding agreement. This is not anything dealing with the act. This is their findings. This has nothing to do with the enactment. They found that the agreement was binding on all parties. The same type of contract you're going to find on our site. Ladies and gentlemen, the same kind of contract you'll find on our site. Let me pull up that contract. I did, we did pull up this. Okay, this ain't the contract, but we did pull up the ancient arbitration junk. Okay? And that's all we were looking for was proof that they were doing arbitrations back in the day okay that's all we were doing that's all we were doing why to let you know that arbitration wasn't something they just came up with okay they didn't create it so they don't get to control it do you understand that this is a grandfathered procedure this arbitration they've been doing arbitration for years for years Okay, so all you got to do is your own research. And have I looked this up before? No, I just know history. I just know how things were done in history. See, this is Xerxes, Xerxes, or Artaxerxes. You heard of the 300? Well, Artaxerxes. And his father, Darius, the Great. Okay, that's what this was about. They defeated the Grecians. The Grecians? Well, I'm sorry. I got to correct that. The Grecians are the ones who came in to defeat it, the Medo-Persian Empire. You see, Xerxes and his father Darius were Persians. And Cyrus was from Medo. And the Greeks were from Mesopotamia. You'll get this history. All you have to do is read the book of Daniels. Daniel, basically the 6th chapter through the 12th chapter. It'll give you the complete history. Okay? Polynomy. Okay? That's the one that they were talking about. Polynomy, he was the one who brought his army and who was making that arbitration deal. Okay? But as you see, the Athenian force destroys the Persian fleet. It was the Grecians, Athens, Greece, the Athenians. That's where you get the 300. The Persian Sea, a Spartan army. That's what that was all about. Any of you who knew anything about the 300, the Spartans, yeah, yeah, there was a reason for that. See, completely routing the Persians on the Greek mainland because it was all prophesied. Now, so that we know, some of the matters were dealt with after all of this when you were because remember we were dealing with spartan but we haven't gotten to the part about the greeks and we haven't gotten to the part about how where the grecian after alexander the great died about how they had to make some deals in order for those kingdoms to stay alive after some hundred years okay so when you get the chance, go ahead and do your research on the Spartans and on the Persians and on the Grecians, okay? And you will see some of the agreements made, including, what was her name? Cleopatra and Anthony. And look at the agreements that were made between the different countries of that time, many of them through arbitration, 
All right, just making sure you understand. I don't know this site. I've never, oh, this is Oxford. I've never been here before. But I'm finding that some of it is very accurate. Only the ones that I've gone over is very accurate. The time period off by a couple of years, but this is just so you know. And all we were doing was searching for arbitration, which has been going on for centuries. So let's find out about the arbitration award. The agreement contained an alternative dispute resolution clause that provided for arbitration as the exclusive remedy for the relief of the parties and the United States. You see, the agreement was between the parties and the United States. They recognized the agreement. The United States consented to the arbitration and the award made there under for equitable relief for the parties in the United States are binding. The awards made there under for the equitable relief of the parties in the United States are binding. That's all we're concerned about. Why? Because it had nothing to do with the arbitration award. It had everything to do with the agreement. That's why the first things they did is they found that the agreement was binding. That there was an agreement that it was binding. This is an outline. And that it contained only one exclusive remedy. Because it was a contract with the United States, the court had no jurisdiction. Only Congress could make that determination. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we created the exact same type of contract. You can find that contract. Let's go. And it goes a little something like this. Run away, love. Sorry, let me get to the right one. Is it this one? Oh, I was already in the right one. Ah, I don't want to do that because I'm going to lose it. Well, I'm finished with this anyway. We've already talked about this, so we're going to go on. TikTok, you'll find it under satcom.com. Then you go to the download files. Then you go to the private arbitration files, private law arbitration files. And then you go, there is the law. And here is the conditional acceptance. Let's open the conditional acceptance. And then you'll get to read uh, the arbitration award, the stipulation, and all of that stuff. Most of it is not necessary for you. The contract is necessary. So this is what we're doing. We're providing this contract to everyone, giving you the instructions on how it is to be, even on the website. What website? This website, the SITCOM Arbitration Association website. You'll find under here what is arbitration, other procedures, and we're getting ready to put up a couple of videos on that site so that you guys will have that. Again, this site won't officially be up until the 15th of December, 2018. That's when we'll start taking applications. As we explained on a previous video, sorry, I got to scroll down, if it'll let me, because a lot of resources I'm using up right now. And I didn't turned off the music, but I'm still using up a lot of resources. So we're going to scroll down and see if we can just show you guys come on there we go right there that's what we're looking for we're looking for these prices to let you go over now we want you to compare these okay we want you to compare the one hundred dollars per hour to the other arbitrators nobody is as reasonable as this and in the month of February, we're going to have a fee waiver form only for those who qualify. Not everybody will qualify for the fee waiver. Okay? Not everybody will get it. Even if you qualify, doesn't mean it will be available to you that month. Why? Because the fee waiver will be compensated by a different organization that will be reimbursed to them at a later time. So, understand the same as and this is the problem with the arbitration process people they charge 200 uh, excuse me $500 an hour okay this is $200 for the first hour why because it's a two hour mandatory minimum so it is $200 for the first hour so the initiating fee for the first session is 500 why? Because all the other fees are added in and you know, those fees are only once except for this one right here. This one is per hour. That's the technician fee because everything is recorded. 
even pay attention I want you to hear this even when we start doing the electronic arbitrations where all the parties do is just send in the evidence send in the proof send in the witness statements and everything is judged based on that information even that will be recorded do you know that if one of the arbitrators if you have an arbitration the arbitrator um, the parties get there and it goes longer than six hours and the arbitrator has to schedule another meeting but the arbitrator is not able to be there at the next meeting that the substitute arbitrator has to sit and listen to the entire arbitration and has to film themselves listening to the entire arbitration they do get compensated for that from the monies that have been paid but that is so that they can be up to speed and they know all the facts of the case before the matter is heard some arbitrations can go longer than three days why because some of them the parties may not be able to continue each day they may only be able to go a couple hours each day some of the issues may be rather extensive but we keep it this way if you meet with an arbitrator and let's say the first hour each party has been is given 30 minutes the first party is given 15 minutes to explain their side the second party is given 15 minutes to explain their side the next party is given 15 minutes to produce any evidence the other party is given 15 minutes to produce evidence that right there is a total of 60 minutes the arbitrator cannot delay so that as to get to the second and fourth and fifth and 18th hour so as to get more funds they cannot do that they must follow the stringent format of time management if the arbitrator fails to be reasonable if they fail to be honest if they fail to rule based on just the facts if they take sides if it is indicated in any fashion that they took sides they can be fined as a result they cannot like you because your name ends in the letter D they cannot appreciate you because you combed your hair a certain way they cannot judge you because your weight is either more than theirs or less than theirs or because your skin color is not the same as theirs they cannot judge you based on anything they can only judge the information as it is presented parties cannot argue with each other they cannot even talk directly to each other everything must be by and through the arbitrator the arbitrator gives three warnings after that the other person is cut completely off not able to participate anymore because that third warning means that they elect to be an absentia the arbitrator is completely immune from any type of consequences as a result of them rendering a decision fairly honestly and impartially you'll find that this is the exact same process with all the other arbitration associations so why would a person or any other group choose the sitcom arbitration association and yes we have arbitration spelled wrong on one of these there it is right there why would anyone choose the sitcom arbitration association now I'll say this so that you'll understand this is still under development that's why we're saying the site won't be complete until the um, 15th of December 2018 the reason why someone would choose the arbitration association of sitcom is because they know that first they're gonna get fairness that nobody is gonna rule on their side because oh they don't like the government or they they appreciate this or they know sitcom is sitcom is not gonna do anything sitcom is not satcom and this arbitration association is not the sitcom you've come to hear about in the past this is its own separate group own separate group of people they have only one rule and that rule is due process they cannot judge any party they cannot be on the side of one party or the next there are no attorneys permitted to speak on behalf of any client unless they can prove that that client is incompetent is a minor who is incapable of being able to speak for themselves and we're not talking about a minor in the sense as to the age of majority act we're talking about a minor who is under the age of 18 or a person who is incompetent and 
is been deemed by law to be incompetent. What about a corporation? No, a corporation can only be represented by an official. An actual official of the corporation was authorized to speak on behalf of that corporation and they must produce a power of attorney notarized and signed by the CEO of that corporation or a member of that board. Other than that, they cannot speak for that corporation and when the arbitration does occur, that corporation is in absentia and the arbitrator will still make a determination based on the facts. This is just the way it is. It has to be fair. It has to be honest. It has to be legitimate. The fee of 500 is a whole lot less than a fee of $2,000. And that was the actual motivation. There is no arbitration association out there helping the people who are low income, helping the people who are lower middle class. But then isn't our society mostly that of the lower middle class? The impoverished individuals? SATCOM, SITCOM, and every other organization I help put together is here to help the common people. And especially now that we can prove that arbitration is a common law, right? That's right, you have a right to arbitration, if you should so choose, but the other party has to agree. There is nobody that can prohibit or tell you, no, you don't have the right to arbitration. Do you have to go to an arbitration association as far as one of those big, huge companies that have 85,000 arbitrators and we have arbitrators who specialize in this, that, and the other? No. Why? Because we're dealing just with a contract. You don't have to understand anything but the basics of contract law. What are the basics? Well, let's do that. Let's show you what are the basics. We're going to go here. Welcome to the SAA, the SITCOM Arbitration Association, a brief overview of what arbitration is and what it is not, and who qualifies to sit or act as an arbitrator, shall be expressed here in this brief tutorial. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be up on the site. There will be a video explaining this, but this language will be on the site, and this will explain to you exactly what arbitration is, what it is not, who gets to be an arbitrator who doesn't get to be an arbitrator, what the SICOM organization will provide as opposed to what other organizations will provide. This is here for you. Now, let's talk about those of you who have these mortgage situations with these companies who are not providing proof, but yet you have a contract. Yet your property is one of those that has mortgage insurance and you have a contract. Well, you send out a contract or excuse me, you send out the conditional acceptance because once they send you a bill, once they send you one of those nice little notices that you are past due or you are in default, that is an offer to contract. Why? Because they're now changing the terms of the agreement. But the agreement includes default. The agreement includes, no, the agreement includes that they are to protect the interests of the borrower. I mean, of the, um, the lender. And if the property has mortgage insurance, that they are to apply for that insurance because that protects the lender in case the borrower should default. That's their job. And they're not doing that. They're not applying for that. But then wait a minute. We have proof that the financial institutions issue book entry credit for the loan, but they didn't tell you. Well, if they have the right to issue Bush entry credit, you have the right to pay back in the same species, especially if they did not reveal all of the matrix of the loan when they lent you the funds in the first place. I have a party who husband died. The property has mortgage insurance, which includes the death of a spouse. The mortgage insurance is included as part of the payment monthly. The premium is included in the monthly payment. So when you say mortgage insurance, the first thing they want to do is talk about PMI. That's a bunch of crap. I was going to say bull, but you know what I mean. There is no way in the world that you're going to make such a high payment monthly and they not tell you that the insurance is included in that monthly premium. 
since the government requires all homes to have insurance on it. I have someone who is a veteran. He has a VA loan, which is a government loan, which the government guarantees the repayment of that loan, and they're trying to kick him out of his home. They cannot do that. Ladies and gentlemen, what if I told you that if you've been placed out of your home, that the bank is supposed to, if they've taken that home and resold that home, they're supposed to indicate on your credit report that that home is now paid for in full, not that it's a foreclosure. They cannot indicate that it's a foreclosure because that means a debt. Once they take your home and they foreclose on you, they have to report that home as being sold, paid in full to you. They're not doing that. Don't worry about it. We, I was telling you all about the gentleman who started his own company. He's been getting that information documented. He's been getting that information documented. That's what we're doing here. We have this offer to contract thing where they're creating contracts. So let's go there. We're here for a moment. We're not going to keep this video too long. But we definitely want to explain this to you so that all of you get it. Now this is, you can type it in on your computer too. We're going house, bill, 1778, and we got to go to the beginning because I forgot to put New Hampshire, NH. Okay, New Hampshire house bill, 1778. Now what most people are not getting, there's something in this country called the interstate compact. You guys know about the Interstate Compact? Now, let me make sure you understand. I learned about the Interstate Compact in the fifth grade in world history. Well, world history was the sixth grade. U.S. history was the fifth grade. Yeah, see, I remember this stuff. His name was Mr. Bates. He was my fifth grade teacher. Mr. Bates was teaching us about the Interstate Compact. I haven't forgotten about that. I tell you, I've been doing this law thing for a while, people. The Interstate Compact, when they formed a so-called nation, there was a problem with the different states because they had all of these different scripts that they were using as currency, and one state wouldn't accept the script of another state. So what the Congress did is they passed this thing called the Interstate Compact, which allowed people to travel from one state to the next. Now, you do need a passport to enter another state. That's called your driver's license. I know you didn't understand that nobody ever told you that you thought a passport was that booklet that you show at the airport. No, it's just there's no place to stamp it. So they waive that by the fact that you've already had it stamped by the previous state. Full faith and credit. Nobody pays attention to the full faith and credit that it has that seal on that item. And they're supposed to accept that for letting you transgress to and from this country. That state ID has the state seal. You don't need a passport. Shh, don't tell nobody. Don't go out there saying that because you, you ain't going to be able to prove it. All right, just saying it. Just making sure you understand the way things are. Now let's go to the bill, please. Bill! Bill! Get over here, Bill! Okay. So what the Interstate Compact allowed was for individuals to be able to do business with back and forth between the states and the travel between the states the interstate compact because of the interstate compact and that's why it's interstate you think it's like the interstate highway that's why they call them interstate people they go from one state to the next okay they're not inside the state they allow people to go from one state to the next that's where the original interstate compact interstate wording came from before here's what you had here's what you had before that you had this stupid thing of interstate that has changed now. Did you notice that now what do they do? They tell you that it's interstate commerce. See, the reason why it's called interstate commerce because the Constitution says that Congress has the right to regulate interstate commerce. We're going to make this bigger so that you guys can see. Uh-oh. Where'd it go? I lost it. Uh oh. Hold on, y'all. Gotta pause, y'all. Don't know where it went. It actually didn't go anywhere. It just flipped over to the next browser. Okay, pay attention. An act relative to registration of commercial vehicles and operators forward slash driver's licenses. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that driver's license is for operators. 
of commercial vehicles, not for passenger cars. Now go back and look at your, pay attention, go back and look at your wonderful little, what is that thing called? Not the certificate of title. Yeah, the certificate of title. And notice how it calls your automobile a passenger car. Well, if your automobile is a passenger car, people, that means that you have to make sure that you have it indicated that it's a passenger car and it's not used for commercial activities. Pay attention. This bill relates to the right to travel and it requires the Department of Safety, the DMV and other states to provide at no cost all non-commercial automobiles and non-commercial conveyance owners a decal or identification card, an identification card. N ladies and gentlemen, you only need an identification card. You don't need a driver's license to operate a passenger vehicle. If anybody tells you you do, then you say, prove it. Do you understand? Show me the law where it says in order for me to drive my passenger vehicle, I need a driver's license. I'm not going to tell you about the insurance part. I'm not doing that. Okay? There is an issue with insurance, but look, I agree that people should have insurance on their automobile. And until you all, can't tell you how I do it, until you all figure out how to take care of the insurance without putting up some piece of paper talking about this legitimate, then pay the insurance. Okay? You can get insurance on the automobile or on your person, but pay the insurance. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. I'm just telling you for now until you figure it out for yourself. Why am I not telling you? Because that's not the form. I'm not here to tell you everything. I'm here to show you that you should know this stuff. Yes, 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 I know, I know things that you don't know, and that's not my fault. Okay, so you will not put that pressure on me. So let me finish. Let me finish. Non-commercial conveyance owners, a decal and identification card that states that the holder is exempt from registration of his or her private passenger car private conveyance under the Uniform Commercial Code exemption for consumer goods and household goods. Every SAT PAC person who signs up for the SAT PAC 1X or the SAT PAC 2 or the X or the SAT PAC Prime or the SAT PAC Plus will get not only a decal but other documentations documenting these facts right here that are in front of you plus information regarding what I just talked to you about that I can't tell you about on this video. All right. Now, let's go down because we need to stroll down. We, I told you you wanted to focus on statement of purpose. Right there. Statement of purpose. The general court, that means the entire Congress assembled, plus the governor and the Supreme Court. Well, general court normally sometimes refers to just the entire Congress, but pay attention finds that the authority of the Department of Safety, DMV, is limited only to commercial users of the public ways. The DMV has no other authority, ladies and gentlemen. They can only deal with those who are engaged in commerce on the highways. Other than that, it is your right to travel to and from because you are a citizen of the state and of the United States of America. And that the corporate state employees, the courts, the governor, the DMV personnel have, by their silence, oh, we ain't going to tell y'all y'all got to uh, ask for the exemption paperwork, failed to and fully inform the sovereign people of this state, the people as a whole are sovereign, not the single person. So many of y'all got that so mixed up. I used to have it mixed up too. But I understand that when they say sovereign people, they are talking about a group and they're not talking about a person. You don't ever hear them say sovereign person. You see them say sovereign people. And people never means one. People means group. It means a body politic of this state that an automobile, passenger car, or private conveyance has been confirmed by the Chief Justice Grimes in 108 New Hampshire, 836 Supreme Court case, went over that case, that to be private property. You cannot be taxed on your private property, ladies and gentlemen. 
unless you're using your private property for profit or gain. So why are you paying taxes on your private property? That's what registration is. That's what property tax is. You cannot be taxed on your private property in the United States, ever. Defined in the current UCC Article 9, Section 109 as household goods and consumer goods, not for commercial use or for profit or gain. Further, the courts have found the courts. What courts? Pay attention. They're not talking about the Supreme Court of the state. They're talking about all of the other courts. Do you understand that? Have you paid attention? The courts have found that corporate public servants who ignore their accountability as mandated in the Bill of Rights have by their silence and failure to fully inform the sovereign people as a group of the consequences arising from the corporate offer to contract is deemed silent deception and inducement to fraud. Now, do you want me to show you where the Supreme Court and the Congress of New Hampshire got this? I want y'all to hold on because y'all gonna understand it's all Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here is one of the instances for which you hear them talking about silent deception. Now, although you guys have just sent, seen it, it's been a couple of minutes for me to pull this up so that I could show it to you. But pay attention. It says the courts. So they're not talking about this court of New Hampshire. They are saying the courts have found that the corporate public servants who ignore their accountability as mandated in the Bill of Rights. This is New Hampshire Bill of Rights, but uh-uh, y'all need to pay attention. They're also talking about the United States Constitution Bill of Rights because the Bill of Rights of every state must conform to the Bill of Rights of the United States. And if you didn't understand that, then you don't know what the requirements are for a state to become part of the Union as mandated by the Northwest Ordinance and other principal laws of the United States. The Bill of Rights have by their silence and failure to inform fully the sovereign people of the consequence. So here is the contract. They have a duty to inform you. They have a duty to inform you. There is where you get to do your pay attention to this word. Unilateral contractual agreement because they have to respond to your agreement because they have a duty to respond. The sovereign people of the consequences arising from the corporate government offered a contract and is deemed silent deception and inducement by fraud. So let's see if the courts have agreed with that. Silence can only be equated to fraud, inducement to fraud, ha ha, when there is a legal and moral duty to speak. They have to answer the questions. There is where you put their conundrum in front of them and say, ah ha, booyah. Okay, anyway. Or, when an inquiry left unanswered will be intentionally misleading. We cannot condone this shocking conduct. If that is the case, we hope the message is clear that this sort of deception, silent deception, will not be tolerated. And if this routine, uh, and if this is the routine, it should be corrected immediately. This is what New Hampshire was saying, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on, that, well, that ain't the only one. That's That ain't the only one. What you mean you finish? Y'all ain't finish. Oh, uh, let's do fraud. Sorry. I just put... Uh, hold on. Do I do... Yeah, I put silent the last time. So let's do silence, okay? Because you notice they said silent twice, okay? That by their silence, that if it's left unanswered, it would lead the other person to do something wrong because they have a duty to give you the information you're asking for, all right? Let's do that. Let's do silence of the lamb. Wait a minute. Stop that. Go back. Uh-oh. Oh, that's because I did that. That's the second time I did that, y'all. That's the third time I did that. I can't see it. It's too small. Thought the... Thought the... I... 
Oh god, that's the problem. I did something wrong, y'all. I gotta undo that. I changed the silence of the lambs. Find next, not replace all. Okay, don't want that one. I want this one. Fraud and deceit. See, uh, fraudulent deception or silent deception, inducement to fraud. Fraud and deceit may arise from silence where there is a duty to speak the truth. This is an Arizona case. I didn't even have to look at it. I know this case. As well as from speaking an untruth. I've known of this case since the 1990s because it was what we were using at that time. Okay, pay attention. This is how, pay attention. Told you this is the courts have repeatedly said. This is what they said. Hold on so y'all can see it. It says the courts have found that corporate public servants who ignore their accountability as mandated in the Bill of Rights have by their silence and failure to fully inform the certain people the consequences of writing for the corporate offer the contract is deemed silent deception and inducement to fraud. Ladies and gentlemen, damages will lie in proper case of negligent misrepresentation of failure to disclose. Now, how many times you've asked the court a question and they have not answered your question? Where one is under duty to disclose facts to another, fails to do so, the other is injured thereby, an action of tort lies against the party to whose failure to perform his duty caused injury. Because they're operating under military guise, ladies and gentlemen, the courts are acting as arbitrators. This is why they're claiming that they don't have to answer your questions. However, that's where you get them back. They give you an offer to contract. They tell you have to show up to court. Then what do you do? Well, they told me I had to show up to court, and I showed up. You do show up, ladies and gentlemen. You don't not show up. Why would you do that? Hold on. I'm looking for something, but that ain't it. Where are you at? I keep forgetting which uh, one I have it under. Okay, there it is. Whew. All right. This is the conditional acceptance document, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, open up. Oh, that's right. I can't do it that way. I have to go here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you this. Let me tell you something. Okay. This is the document we have online. This one is specifically designed for mortgages. You can feel free to add whatever you want to this. This has all of the basic root requirements. Why? Because we show that there's a relationship between you and the other party for them to respond, especially regarding mortgages. Okay? We put the information about the act of March 9, 1933, Proclamation 2038, 2039, 2040, and titles. 4, 7, 11, 12, 15, 16, 18, 28, 31, and 42. CFR, the foreign registry thereof, is not that of a corporation, quasi-corporation, in which, in other words, these are all corporate titles, corporate statutes. So we're putting questions before them that they cannot get around. The powers granted to an administrative body may be such as to establish it as a legal entity, and although not expressly declared to be a corporation, it may be considered a public quasi corporation the interstate commerce commission is a body corporate with legal capacity to be a party plaintiff and defendant of the federal courts some administrative agencies are corporate bodies with legal capacities to sue and be sued okay we put facts in here that if they agree to these facts it changes the whole dynamics of a case it now takes away that power that they thought they had it now reveals the truth Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, what I should explain to you all, because I have to explain it. If I don't, you won't get it. Some of y'all are going to be, uh-huh, watch and see what happens to him. If one is to be re re erased, it will be because of this information. This is the same information I gave you in that video, people. The exact same information. Why do you think Congress had no other choice but to rule that what these gentlemen had done was 100% legitimate? was binding on all parties. Now, we did it in proof of claim because they did it in proof of claim. They had the idea correctly. Okay? Then we put there, Federal Reserve notes are not redeemable and receive no backing by anything. This has been the case since 1933. The notes have no value in themselves. This is taken from the official website of the United States Financial Expert 
the United States Department of the Treasury, whose job it is to print the money to be utilized by the public, and note how they say that since the government declared bankruptcy in 1933, their notes have no value. Can they disprove this? Of course they can't. Then notice number five, proof of claim that the original lender did not lend. That's not supposed to be land. It's supposed to be lend. So all of you who have this, you got to change that. Bookkeeping entry credit in the form of a loan and failed to provide such notification in clear and unambiguous conspicuous language testimony or terminology, excuse me, that any reasonable man or woman would understand. Intentionally created fraud in the factum and withheld from plaintiff vital information concerning said debt and all of the matrix involving the making of the loan. This is Deutsche Bank versus Peabody, an unpublished case, but none yet still a fact of law. All right. Then we talk about the banking holiday, proof of claim this, proof of claim that, proof of claim this. Ladies and gentlemen, if they answered these questions correctly, guess what the problem is? That means they have no claim, especially proof of claim that there is no lawful money statute, or excuse me, lawful statute and or constitution delegation of authority authorizing your institution and in creating book entry credit as a form of acceptable currency within the United States. There is no law. They only used the Proclamation 2039 in order to do this, which was invalid because it could not be applied to the people. Then we put the intentions of Congress in the document for you. Tell them that this was Congress's intentional uh, intent. And here is where the declaration of the banking holiday is, where it gives them to define the banking institution. And this applies to banking institutions. And who are banking institutions? Any and all persons shall include all persons engaged in the business of transacting any other form of banking business. So anyone engaged in banking business doesn't matter if you have a credit card or a debit card. That's banking business, people. Doesn't matter if you pay a telephone bill or a gas bill. That's banking business. Lord, have mercy. I know some of you are just getting it, and I'm sorry about that, okay? Mama, no, mama, no, mama, no! Okay, let's get back to what the Senate said about how those proclamations by the president are still there and how the United States claims that they own all property in the United States and it, how it, the stupid monies will represent a mortgage on all of the homes, okay? And that anyone who demands payment for a debt in any particular kind of coin or currency is doing something that is against public policy, which cannot be tolerated in this country ever. It's against the law. It cannot violate public policy and that they created now wait a minute are the banks supposed to know this when you ask the banks this question since 1933 the United States has been in a state of declared national emergency and these proclamations gave forth the 470 provisions of law of course they are because ignorance of the law is no excuse so we can ask them legal questions all right let's continue to go on you see all these little points we're bringing up this is only number 27 but this is not the 27th question because they also have to answer these questions right here. Do you see? That's the way the document is worded. And this is the Twaiting with the Enemy Act. Twaiting with the Enemy Act. In a minute of Twaiting with the Enemy Act, Congress did provide for the continuation of the emergency of any economic and of any economic sanctions that were the result of the presidential declaration of national emergency that were in effect in July 1st, 1977, which subject to automatic termination unless it was renewed. But remember, continuation of the emergency. Congress did not formally terminate the one declared by President Roosevelt. See, only believing that only the president could do so. That's right, because they gave him the exclusive authority. The elimination of the exclusion made clear that any and all emergency powers that might be previously, no, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you why Congress could not take away the act of March 9th, or the proclamation, 2039. Pay attention. 
During such holiday, the Secretary of the Treasury, with the approval of the President and under such regulation as he may prescribe, is authorized and empowered to permit any and all banking institution to perform any and all of the usual banking functions. You see, they gave him the exclusive authority. They did not say Congress. They said the President along with the Secretary of the Treasury. <sighs> That's why the President said, I, therefore, Theodore Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States of America, in view of such national emergency, so anytime you hear them use the phrase national emergency, whether it's a hurricane or anything else, it's under this act, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by said act. That's right. They gave him the authority. They never gave a provision in that authority for taking it back, i.e. only the president could declare that over. That's what they were saying. You get it? See? Congress did not formally terminate the one declared by President Roosevelt, apparently believing that only the president could do so because they never gave anyone else the authority. How do you know all of this? Because it's right here. It's right here in front of us. They're not hiding this stuff, people. But the Trading with the Enemies Act was a military act. Congress has no control over what the president does. The president does militarily only if he's declaring war. By the way, people, if you didn't understand it before, please understand. The Emergency Banking Act of 1933 is a bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is an emergency. Financial emergency is bankruptcy. Okay? So the Emergency Banking Relief Act is bankruptcy. That's where you get uh, James Trafficant. I say I keep saying John, but it's James Trafficant. That's where you get him saying that. Now, hold on. So that you guys get it. As a consequence, the State Department asked that Section 5B be excluded from the National Emergencies Act until other legislation providing a basis for the continuation of economic sanctions against those countries. What countries? North Korea, Cuba, China, and North Vietnam. Okay, could be enacted. Is this not the case? Because that's exactly what they allowed that act to continue, and they have not replaced it, because if they replaced it, pay attention, if they replaced it, the March 9, 1933 Act and the Presidential Proclamation, there would be something on record where they replaced it since 1976. They would have to indicate that this hereby repeals and replace blah, blah, blee, blah, 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 blah. See, allows the sanctions to continue. Let's scroll down just a little bit. All right. Where's my mouse? There you are. Bankruptcy and the national banking holiday, as well as the sanctions against the regimes like Cuba, Korea, China, North Vietnam, to continue without the president having to declare a new national emergency under the International, what I forgot what this stands for, but it's a emergency act. Uh, but I forgot what the name of it is. They mentioned it up there, but I'm not going up there. I, I it, no, that's too high up. I get dizzy, so we ain't going up there. Yes, I'm an idiot. All right, we still got about 10 more minutes of talking, ladies and gentlemen, so that we can explain. Here's the caveat. Ooh, I like caveat, man, that, but they're expensive and they're they so small and they just they taste like fish. That's caviar. Yeah, well, oh, 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 okay. Anyway, please understand why the undersigned, whoever's signing it, wants, wishes, and desires to resolve this matter as promptly as possible. The undersigned can only do so upon the respondent's official response to the conditional acceptance for value counter offer claim proof of claim by the respondents providing the undersigned with the requested necessary proofs of claim as raised here and above. Therefore, the undersigned is not a signatory nor a party to your social compact, your government contract, contract known as the Constitution Charter of the United States, nor notice nor cognizant of any agreement contract between the United States and the undersigned and specifically any obtained through full disclosure and certain blah, 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 blah. Again, we cover everything. The one thing you must put in this document is that this contract supersedes any and all prior, 
present and future contracts respecting these parties and this matter or anything in relation thereto. And you must remember this contract is irrevocable. Okay? Or ill air 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 irrevocable. You know, the individual, this was Mr. Christopher Stark who added the catbird seat. I had not heard that term before. But guess what? We ask, can they respond? Therefore, as respondents have superior knowledge of the law, access to the requested and necessary proof of claims or otherwise being in a cat's bird seat to provide the requested and necessary proof of claim raised here and above, the respondent is able, 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 capable, and most qualified to inform the underside of those matters relating to or bearing upon the above reference alleged civil commercial cause and thereby therein clear up any and all confusion. Ladies and gentlemen, let us get to the chase. We put this document up there. Couldn't tell you why we were putting it up there, but we put this up there so those of you who have issues with banks that they are not responding. We have a situation right now where a bank did not respond to our QWR and while you send out a QWR they are not supposed to be able to proceed with any foreclosure. They must stop all foreclosing and debt collection activities until they provide an answer to the QWR. Well they provided an answer to the QWR on the 14th and less than a week and a half later they sold the property at foreclosure sale. The only problem is we had a contract this contract right here okay so now we just wait for our arbitration hearing and we go to the arbitration and we get our arbitration award so when they try to foreclose uh, uh, sorry what what they they're putting up a contract that contracts not even notarized that's not that's not even certified here's a notarized and certified contract right here it's arbitration award in the contract all right here all one agreement so we have evidence they have none those are copies those are in, inadmissible and they can't trump ours because our contract supersedes theirs because they're a party to this contract they agreed to these terms by acquiescent tacit acquiescence okay ladies and gentlemen give me a second i gotta make sure something is in here in the document for you guys oh i'm not gonna wait let me see let's do this Okay, there he is. I R R E V. Uh oh. Nope, the word irrevocable doesn't appear here. So you guys are going to have to add the term irrevocable. It appears in the one that I have. Wait, as a matter of fact, hold on, let me make sure. Okay, I just checked. It doesn't appear on the one that I had, and I just realized why it doesn't appear on the one that I have because this document gives us power of attorney. And it is, we then create another document called a power of attorney that includes the words irrevocable. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are to do is you are to make this a self executing binding irrevocable agreement. You have to do coupled with interest. Give me one second. I got to look for that word too. Uh. Uh oh. Okay, you have to add coupled with interest in your document. So what I'll do is I'll polish this thing up, put it back online for you all. See this number right here? You got to create your own number. This is just a generic number that we put up there for you guys. But you have to create your own number. It has to be coupled with interest. It has to be irrevocable. Now this one is already irrevocable because it gives the power of attorney. Okay, and the power of attorney includes the phrase coupled with interest. And the other documents sent to them coupled with interest. Um, do I have a notice of default? <sighs> Give me a second. Let me pull up a notice of default. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as you see, the notice of default, this communication is to inform you that you are in default of the agreement. As per the terms of the agreement, you have consented and agreed to all the terms and conditions contained therein, including but not limited to the self-executing irrevocable durable power of attorney coupled with interest. Okay, there is a durable power of attorney. It's coupled with interest because if you don't couple it with interest, you can be barred from making a monetary claim. Okay, so 
We do the self-efficacy screening. Every other couple do a power of attorney. We give them 10 days, and they miss the 10 days. Tell them that they failed to respond, and look at what we put in here. This is what I've been wanting to show you. I didn't know it was in here, but it's in here. Will you put that up for us? Yes, I'll do that, but this I'll have to put it up later. This is for Verizon. Pay attention. It was his legal duty to speak up or to deny that he would agree to pay the commission when advised that the sale would not be commensurated except on the owner's original terms. This is whether or not a party has to respond. The court, because it provides a legal function, i.e. a government function, was required to respond to questions within their preview and sphere of expertise. The true axis of the case at bar is succinctly stated in 9 Corpus Juris Secundum as follows. And this is a court using this. The real estate broker representing one party cannot recover commission from the other party. Thus, where the broker is employed by the employer of the land, the owner of the land, to sell the same. This was a case where the individual said, hey, I want you to sell my property. You're going to be my broker. And the guy says, okay, I'm going to bring some people over to you. And he brought the person over to him. And then what happened is later, the person he brought over and the owner, they made a deal between each other and they ignored him. The purchaser is not liable to the broker for the broker's commission unless he has agreed to the conditions of the sale, which included the payment of the commission by the purchaser, or unless he has agreed to the with the broker to pay him. The access of the case at bar rep rest upon the petitioner's insistence that Mr. Murray assumed liability by his silence and by his failure to acquaint the petitioner with his intentions to negotiate with the owner of for the purchase of the land. Yes, he agreed the moment he went over to the home and he told him, I'm the broker for this house. Okay, now hold on. This is where we get to that estoppel. The question of when a person becomes legally obligated by another by his silence varies depending upon certain facts and in every case. Hold on, let make, let's make show. The law of estoppel is a branch of the law of evidence, for it is the law by which the evidence of the truth is excluded. Equity does not favor estoppel against the truth. And it has been broadly said, perhaps too broadly, that where the element of fraud is wanting, there is no estoppel. There you go. It is a growing branch of law in which the cited cases are of less value than usual for the reason that every cause must depend upon its own particular facts and circumstances, i.e. case law does not apply. It applies to the wording of the contract. Watch this. As a general rule, there must be word or conduct by one party, the language of the contract and the agreement, or action based thereon by the other party, and injury to the latter to preclude the admission of evidence in conflict to the word or conduct. That's what this is. Now, again, under contracts, America's Jurisprudence, Section 40, page 533, as authority in support of the defendant's liability arising from the implied contract, implied contract, and is furthermore stopped to dispute such liability because of his silence. And here it is. As a general rule... Silence and inaction do not amount to acceptance of an offer, thus generally speaking, mere silence or failure to reject an offer when it is made does not constitute acceptance. Hold on! Under some circumstances, however, silence and inaction operate as an acceptance. Why? Because the other party is made aware. Hold on! And as where, under the circumstances, an inference of assent is warranted, or at least where under the circumstances such an inference is required and is necessary, you've received this, you need to respond. You have 10 days. If you need more days, we'll give it to you. But if you don't respond, it will be construed as your acceptance of the offer. That's the point. 
An agreement inferred from silence must rest upon the principle of estoppel, must rest upon the principle of estoppel, cannot rest upon anything else, and a change of position in reliance on such silence, yes, because we're going to rely on their silence, resulting in substantial injury, yes, because if their silence does not equate to estoppel, then it's caused us injury, is an essential element of the estoppel. It is said that circumstances which will impose a contractual obligation by mere silence, you do it all the time when you go to court, are exceptional in their character and are of rare occurrence. No, they're not when you do it right. And no legal liability can arise out of mere silence by a party sought to be affected unless he is subject to a duty to reply. There's a current relationship between the party which is neglected. They're required to respond. If it's your bank, you ask them a question regarding the note, the, regarding the finances, they must respond. There's a contractual relationship. They gave you a conditional offer saying that they were changing the terms to the harm of the other party. A mere failure to reject amounts to an a, a mere failure to reject amounts to an acceptance where the offeree has agreed in advance that such silence is to be construed or where there is some duty resting upon him to that effect. Ladies and gentlemen, in our document, is it this one? This ain't it. Yeah, that's the one we asked for proof of life, but that ain't it. In our document, notice what we say about their mere silence and the fact that it is a bank or a financial institution that we're dealing with that has an obligation with us. We have a contract. Okay, this is the arbitration. And this one says that if they fail to respond, pay attention, and the like, service to the respondents, well, uh, no, that's not, that's the, that's the corporate stuff. We need to go competent, original jurisdiction, need to have the failure to respond part. I read it to you earlier, I'm going to read it to you one more time. Okay. That by the respondent's failure and or refusal to respond and provide the requested and necessary proof of claims raised herein, above and thereby and therein, expressly consent and agree to set facts, and as a result of the self-executing agreement, the following is contingent. So yes, the contract is binding. How do we know? Because I've already read to you what Congress had to say about it. That's why. That's how we know. So what SACOM is going to do is we're going to continue to provide the contract for all of you. We're going to put in all of the things that are necessary for that contract. Then you are going to fill out that contract. Now, if you need an arbitrator, I need an arbitrator. Well, if you need an arbitrator, then you need to understand not this one. That ain't the arbitration one. This is the arbitration group. If you need an arbitrator, this is where you got to go after the 15th of December. After the 15th of December, everyone. They will be set up and ready for you to have your arbitration. You see, because many of my contracts, that's what I've been doing over the past four months, is putting together the contracts, going over the language, making sure all of mine was sent out. And you know, not a single one responded to my contract. Lord have mercy. So we're going to go through arbitration, but we're going to have our arbitration without hearing. Our hearing will be electronically. We'll do ours through the email process where we send it to the arbitrator and the arbitrator makes a decision. Now, I'm going with sitcom because with the other associations, you have no proof that the arbitrator even read over your documents. When you send it to them electronically, they can make whatever decision they want because they'll say they went over it. Yeah, they just went through a couple of pages. You know how judges used to do? Look at the back of the document and say, I don't see anything here for which I can act upon. Because they're looking at the back of the document. Because they're sitting so high up, you can't see the desk. Okay, not with sitcom. Sitcom, the arbitrator has to actually record they're going over your documents. Amazing, ain't it? That such a rule and provision would be set up so that everybody can see that everything is above par, that they are above board, that they are doing everything by the book, that they are going over the document. And if they want to, during their review of the document, they can document their order on record and on paper. That's their choice as an arbitrator. They cannot be told how to arbitrate your matter. 
They can only be given the rules and they must follow the rules of due process. But they cannot be told. Nobody can tell them which way to rule. Nobody can tell them what to consider. They must consider each arbitration the exact same way according to the terms of the contract. Now you, when you write into them, you can tell them these are the points. This is it. This proves this. This proves that. This proves this. This proves that. And then you'll find this on page such and such, paragraph such and such. You'll find this on page such and such, paragraph such and such. That's what you have to do. Okay? Whew. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a whole lot of talking. But there is the organization, Sitcom Arbitration Association. This is a informal introduction to the world. This is not affiliated with SACOM. It's affiliated with Sitcom. Sitcom is an organization that was formed out of the Nevis Islands uh, roughly about 2012. It was formed for such situations such as this. Sitcom is also the parent organization of the organization known as TTOPP that you've heard about from this channel. Nobody else is doing this. Nobody else is offering arbitration. There are going to be some people who are going to try to duplicate this. They don't have the experience or the skills. Sorry. Not even the organizations that are out there doing this for people are capable of doing what we're doing because none of them will even think about providing a basic contract for people who have a basic problem. And that is finances, dealing with banks, dealing with credit card companies, dealing with automobile companies. But again, a document was provided for you all to amend, to adapt to those situations. And all you got to do is add in. Now, again, uh, roughly by Tuesday, which is the 4th of December, we will have those other points added to this document, and then it will be free for you to download. So there you are, ladies and gentlemen, the information you've been waiting for. And yes, you have been very patient and waiting for months. Whoo, doggy. But it took that long for us to get everything together to make sure because we had to make sure we just couldn't rely on people's word. We just couldn't rely on the fact that we had a law from Congress, but we do now understand why they have tried to hide this from the public. This is how people get out of tight situations. This is how people redo those contracts who are in jail for non-capital offenses in jail for non-offenses that cause no harm to their fellow man who are in jail for commercial crimes. This is how they get themselves extricated from such an environment. Extricated? Did you learn a new word? No, I've known that word for quite some time. I actually had to tell that to a police officer when I told him about my running a cow off my land and I had to extricate him from my land is what I told that officer. And prior to that, I had never used that word before. Really? That's correct. Like I said, I know things that I shouldn't know. I understand things I shouldn't understand. And I stake, and I promise every last one of you of this, I stake everything that I know about law on this process. If I wasn't so sure about it, I would not be bringing it to your attention because those of you who know me know for a fact that I'm not going to sit up there and have you do something so that it brings me a profit. I'm not making a dime off of this. SACOM is not making a dime. All SACOM is doing is providing the technical know-how to the organization. That's it. They're not doing anything else. They're not involved in SAA at all. They're just providing the technical services, the telephone number, the email, and they don't even control the emails. And the web address. Oh, and I'm sorry, the basic rules according to due process for hearing a matter and not taking sides and also providing penalties, including and not limited to if an arbitrator fails to follow the rules, if they pick sides or choose sides that they can be reported to the district attorney's office. <sighs> so, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents. Thank you for letting me bring this information to you about the arbitration process. Hopefully this video will be up later today, if not tomorrow. Have a good evening. It's been a long, long five months going nonstop without a break. It's been a long time. But this was done for you guys. This is what I've been looking for for the last 30 years. It's a process like this. One whereby we didn't have to rely on the courts. 
one whereby we received a private remedy that had to be acknowledged by everyone once we completed it. Now remember, the Sitcom Arbitration Association will not handle matters where people are asking for 85 godzillion dollars. If it is unreasonable, Sitcom will not handle it. They will only do treble damages. They will only do treble damages. You need to understand that. Because treble damages will include your administrative fees. Oh, what if I document half? $200 billion. What they do? They will only award you trouble damages and you are stuck with that. You cannot then do another contract because that contract is binding and it's dealing with that one matter. If you give them a broad contract, if you change the language up so much to where the contract is baseless, they will make a determination on that. So you're going to have to be very careful about how you rearrange the contract. See, the contract is not so broad that it can be ignored by the courts, but if you do that, the arbitrator will have no choice but to say that yours is broad and ambiguous and makes no sense. And they will do it as nonsensical and you get nothing. Okay? It really is that simple, that pointed. Oh, and by the way, if you do give them a contract and you add so many words and so many phrases to where it doesn't make any sense, then the panel gets to go over it. And the panel, if they determine that, the panel gets to go over it. And the panel, if it renders a decision, then you're, you know. So again, stick to the format. We provided a simple contract that applies to every financial situation. All you gotta do is put in the right information. All the other information about the laws and stuff are fact. And we have to change one more thing because in here I believe it says that the Federal Reserve prints money. Well, the Federal Reserve was authorized to print what's called emergency script. The Federal Reserve is not printing the money. It is the Treasury who's printing it. And the Treasury are printing the Federal Reserve notes through the U.S. Mint. Now, could it be that they're doing it on behalf of the Federal Reserve? No, because the Treasury was the one giving the authorization under the Proclamation 2039, as you saw. Only the President and the Treasury Department had that authority and responsibility. They didn't give any authority to the Federal Reserve by those acts. So that's how you know that it's being done under the Treasury. So that information, I believe we did change it, but I will go back and make sure that it is changed. The documents will be up by the 4th. Ladies and gentlemen, that's me taking a deep breath because this has been a whirlwind. Have a very good day, and I'm grateful that you allowed me to bring this information to your attention. And do not, please, do not email uh, the Sitcom Arbitration Association prior to the 15th because your emails will not get answered. The emails have been assigned, but they have not been assigned the support email or the administrative emails. That's intentional because they are preparing and making sure they will comply with all laws. So they are training so that they can understand the rules and regulations. Okay, thank you for your time. Have a very good day. Have a very good life. Have a very good night. Have a very good morning. Have a very good afternoon. And thank you for allowing us, me, Eon, to bring this information to your attention. And those of you who are sat pack people, please understand that we've already included you in a contract that protects you. Just we'll reveal that to you as soon as the arbitration is complete because the arbitration is the final piece of the puzzle. So as soon as that's done, we'll reveal the contract to you and we will put the contract online so all of you will have the option of downloading it and seeing what it says for yourself and how it protects you. And you keep a copy of that contract with you. Okay, the power of attorney, I can't give you. But the power of attorney is implied in the agreement. That's why you saw me show you the self-executing power of attorney. Okay, where we showed you that language where this document dealt primarily with the self-executing power of attorney. Okay, that was the point for this. This is Verizon. But we added that law, that stuff right there on purpose. But you see... Self-executing, irrevocable, durable power of attorney coupled with interest. You see, we retain the right to do that. Oh, supersedes any and all previous contract between the parties 
and is a legally binding contractual obligation upon all parties associated thereto. That's how we took care of that because it wasn't in the original contract we put it in this. But this will be in your contract. Okay? Not the power of attorney, but the self-executing, irrevocable, irrevocable, um, binding contractual agreement. What is it? Uh, I can't think of it right now, and I'm trying. A conditional acceptance of offer coupled with interest. That will be in the document that we put up there for the rest of you guys. You will have that soon. The idea is for you to go to the site. Go to the site. Go to the site. What do I do when I get there? You're going to go to the site. And what you're going to do is you're going to go over the information. What information? Hold on. These documents right here, especially document 10, 11, and 6. You're going to go over those documents. And then you're definitely going to go over restatement of second contracts. Why? Oh, and here's a copy of the self-executing power of attorney. That's an example. Okay, but you're going to go over that. Then you're going to go over the arbitration order. The arbitration order. You're going to go over that. And once you go over the arbitration order, then you're going to go ahead and understand exactly what you're going through. Okay. Then you'll have a better understanding of what's required, what's needed. Your document does not have to be as long as the original document from the individuals who did this process in the first instance. You will not have to be this one right well it's not that one I think it is 4.5 nope that's a different one I need the big one that's the stipulation I need the original contract I don't know which one is the original contract I believe that's no that's the power of attorney one of these is the original contract yours does not have to be as long as his original contract his original contract he was making sure he added so much and it was a criminal matter that he was dealing with but he was making sure that he asked so many points of averments that they could not respond reasonably to his points of averments without giving up the farm. And that's why Congress said what they said, because he put them in a position, a uh, catch-22, to where they could not respond by the way his questions were asked. And he asked legitimate questions. He didn't ask those YouTube questions. He did not ask any of those questions people be hearing on YouTube because they ain't got no proof to substantiate. And please understand if there is one of those or several of those points you raise in your document that is not substantiated with any type of proof on your part and you're just asking that <clears throat> question because it is one of those YouTube things, I don't know what the arbitrator will do regarding that. I cannot tell you because there are no instructions for them on that. Okay. All I can tell you is be careful. Keep your questions to questions you know the answer to and you know you can back those answers up by law and not case law. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good night. Have a good life. Have a good bye, everyone.